So people are starting to arrive in. You're all very welcome to um, Smashing Times Arts, Climate Change and Sustainability panel dis discussion. Uh, it's taken part as taken place as part of the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival 2021. Um, we may just give a few more minutes just for people to arrive. Um, I see the numbers are steadily going up. So with us this evening, uh, my name is Geraldine McAlinden. I'm an actor, writer, director and producer, and I'm delighted to be a collaborator with Smashing Times uh, within this festival and within the, the, um, the initiative of the State of the Arts, which has been running for most of the pandemic. Um, I wanted to introduce Mary Moynihan. We have Mary, who's a writer, director, theatre and filmmaker and is the art Artistic Director of Smashing Times International Centre for the Arts and Equality. We also have with us Nick Anton, who's the Technical Manager of Donamia's Arts Centre. And we also have Maeve Stone, who's a writer, director, theatre and filmmaker. So, uh, the order of events this evening are we will have a presentation from Mary, followed by Nick and Maeve with some questions and answers afterwards. Uh, so please feel free, everyone, to put your questions um, into the Q&A box and share any comments. And if we have time, we will get to those at the end. So, Mary, could I invite you to, um, to kick off with your presentation? Thank you very much, Geraldine, and um, thank you to Smashing Times and to everybody who's behind the scenes helping to run the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival. And I'm delighted to be able to talk tonight on this particular theme around climate change and the environment. And I'll just talk a little bit first about the festival itself, because the whole idea behind the festival is to, it's the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival, and it's been running for, it runs for 10 days from the 15th to the 24th of October. And the key aim of the festival is to raise awareness of the work of human rights defenders in Ireland around the world, and also to raise awareness of how we can celebrate human rights. So we're looking at stories of human rights defenders from the past and from the present, and also looking at what human rights are. So, for example, we've had a number of events already which have been about looking at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, for example, Geraldine, you've been involved in a performance called Rights on the Rooftop, which we presented on the rooftop of the Chester Beatty. And that was created by a number of artists who were finding a poetical response to what human rights means to them. And I think this is very important, this idea of talking about what human rights actually are, because for me, human rights are about promoting dignity and respect for all people equally. And I think human rights are such a key part of our lives on an everyday basis. And yet it's probably something we don't often talk about. So for example, one of the, one of the beautiful pieces of work we had in Rights on the Rooftop was a piece that Geraldine had created, which was basically talking about the different human rights in the Universal Declaration. The right to own our own home is a basic human right. The right to medical care, the right to an education, the right to a decent standard of living, the right to leisure, the right to the arts, and the right to have a, a world that we can protect and live in and a world that supports us. And I think this whole idea of climate change and climate justice is really important as a topic that the arts can be instrumental in raising awareness of. And for example, what we're doing in Smashing Times at the moment is we're running a performance which is happening outdoors in Rathfarnham Castle, and it's called Gathering on the Pond. And our key theme in that performance is the idea of what we're doing in it is in a fun way, trying to raise awareness of science and the environment and what's happening. And what we've chosen to do in Gathering on the Pond is we're focusing on, it's the story of a young woman scientist and she's an ornithologist and her passion in life is birds. And she has this ability to 
the birds speak to her, she understands their language. So it really is a fun play. We've had over 300 young people come to see it this week. And the idea is, as somebody said today, layered through a fun performance um, is five or six messages around what's happening to our environment, but all through the prism of the life of a, a bird. So it's set in a Farm and Castle Park, and some of the characters in it are the birds who come to life to talk about their world. But through those fun stories, young people are hearing messages about what we, what's happening to our environment and what we can do. And I think the arts work very well around raising awareness of human rights, not when they're didactic. So it's not about taking a message and I suppose banging home that message. It's more about telling stories. So you're telling stories around how do you take an issue, turn it into a story that has an emotional engagement and tell it in either a fun way or a serious way, but in a way that is told through an emotional engagement. So you're drawing people into the story and maybe you've layered through that facts about what's happening around your particular issue, but it's very much done so in a way that engages with people on an emotional level. And part of the play that we created, we were very much inspired by um, Greta Thunberg and what she was saying around the fact that this idea that we're facing a mass extinction and what we've discovered from working with young people around the issue of climate justice and climate change is that there's a huge amount of knowledge out there already. It's a key issue that people are very, young people in particular, are very clued into, very concerned about, and very key, very uh, wanting to do something and are doing something. Um, and this idea of saving the planet and promoting climate change is something I find young people are already aware of. And something that we're trying to put across in the performance we're doing is this idea that it's not just, it requires two things, if you like, personal change on the one hand and political action on the other hand. So this idea of how do we promote individual change and how, we, how, can, how can we support an eco-friendly approach to the environment, an eco-friendly way to live, all the different things that we can do ourselves from, um, you know, simple things like not using plastic to, uh, traveling on public transport, those simple basic things we can bring into our life. But what we're particularly interested in getting across is this idea that if we talk about just personal change, that's not enough. How do you generate political action? And this idea, I think in particular around political action is to do with tackling large corporations on the idea of fossil fuels, palm oil and deforestation. So we're very much encouraging through the work we're doing, this idea of personal responsibility, but equally looking at the question, and for me, this is an important question. And I've just talked about the idea of the arts being used to raise personal stories. So how do you bring in what, how do you bring in the, the idea or the theme of questioning political power? Because we can talk about the issues, we can raise awareness of the issues, the arts are brilliant for doing that, but then we need to go beyond that, I think, and this idea of where does political power lie? Who creates political power? Who has access to political power? And what can ordinary people do in terms of looking for our human rights? How can our human rights, how can our human rights be brought about by connecting with what political power is? And what I mean by that is, it's this idea of, I suppose it's the idea of, uh, in terms of the environment, who has caused the damage up to now? Because these are the questions we need to be asking. And for me, um, you know, if you look at the facts and figures, you can actually name 100 companies who have been responsible for 70% of, the, of the, the damage that has happened to our environment to date. And I think this idea of how do we hold the governments to account in terms of not putting the onus, if you like, just on ordinary people, not putting the cost for climate change on ordinary people. How do we ensure that governments are held accountable and the corporations are held accountable for the damage that has been done, but are held accountable in order to bring about change? So this idea of political power is something I would say that when it comes to the arts, we're telling a wonderful story through a play of a young woman whose world is about working with you know, her job as a young scientist is she's working with birds and the environment and she's talking about the damage and the impact she's seeing. 
But then what we do is we open it up to the audiences after for discussion and debate around, okay, we're raising awareness of the issues, but now what can we do? And it's putting those questions out there. And I think that's something I would personally would love to see people. I'd love to see artists talking about when we talk about artists, where does power in the arts lie? Who determines what type of art is seen? Who determines who funds the arts? What arts gets made? And then to bring those discussions out into the wider world, which I think the arts are, are, are a powerful way of doing. And I'll just finish up by saying that Mary Robinson, she talked about the idea of if we want to look at climate justice, she really feels, and I think this is very important, that we find a way to embed the fact that we can only tackle climate justice if we actually take it from a human rights approach. So coming at it from a human rights approach is really, really important. And putting human rights at the heart of our world and the heart of our environment. And I think hopefully that's what the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival has been doing and what we're very interested in doing through the arts. Um, and there's a whole load of other projects that I know of different artists in Ireland around the world that are doing. And I'm going to put up links at the end to, to the different projects that I um, have heard about or have been involved with using the arts for climate justice and climate change. Um, and I hope to see much more work in the arts being done around this particular issue. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mary. You've raised some very interesting points there. And, and one thing I just chip in with was being involved in Rights on the Rooftop um, just really brought it home to you. Uh, Theatre in nature. Uh, the fact that you are on a roof out, you know, in whatever the weather decides to throw at you, it's possible. Uh, so maybe I think with the pandemic has certainly brought a newfound respect for nature where people were limited and where they could go. Parks mm. suddenly took on a new huge importance. Um, Travelling by foot or by bicycle, again, took on a, a whole new importance. So hopefully one of the positives that will come out of the pandemic is um, will be a permanent, a, a permanent respect for those matters. Uh, here's hoping anyway. Um, so Nick, maybe we can we can come to you with with um, what 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 ideas you have in relation to arts, climate change and sustainability. Today. Yeah, absolutely. That was um, that was inspiring that uh, from Mary. Um, and I, I feel that what I have to say is so nuts and bolts after uh, all these wonderful high flying ideas and what the arts can do. But I'm looking at this very much from a, a pragmatic point of view in terms of a venue and what the what the physical venues uh, can do. So while obviously there's an impact on the arts and uh, we're nurturing the arts in our venue in Leash, um, it was about how we <clears throat> could uh, could green uh, the Dunamay's Arts Centre. So it, it kind of goes back to about uh, 2009. Well, it actually goes a lot further back. Theatre lighting uh, would be the, the one of the key issues everybody thinks uh, about greening the arts. <clears throat> and that kicked off in 1882 with a performance of I. Lanthe in the, um, in the Savoy Theatre in London. That's for the, for the nerds in the audience. That was the first uh, show designed with electric lighting. And when I started this journey, my key was to change the tungsten lighting in the venue to LED lighting. And for me, that was the sort of, this was the thing to get done. And through an initiative with Leash County Council, um, a chap called Phil Walker from Echo Merit um, came to visit us one day. And he was talking about uh, making the council buildings more sustainable and we got chatting and uh, I realized that I was completely off the mark. The thing that really made uh, the Dunamay's Arts Centre greener was the day-to-day -day use of the building. So it started off with um, it started off with uh, measurement. So we started to record weekly electricity use, weekly water use, weekly heating, but we also uh, recorded what spaces were being used, how many people were used in those spaces, what, what was it a performance, was it a rehearsal, was the lighting rig used, was the sound rig used, was it just tables and chairs, where we, were we giving people bottles of water, all of that sort of stuff. So after the first few months uh, of measurement, we were able to graph where the, the largest use of energy was and uh, 
and it became really apparent that um, heating of the building was uh, woefully inefficient. The lighting of the, of the building, never mind the theatre, was um, way too bright and uh, again, very inefficient. There were no proper controls to it. And the other thing was water. So we had no budget for this in the first place. So the first thing we did was we did a water leak check. And it turned out that um, in the first year, we were using two and a half million litres of water in the art centre. That's the size of an Olympic swimming pool. So this was basically down to leaky taps, toilets that weren't set properly and there was water running down the back of them, people, uh, people leaving taps on and um, and uh, what was the other? there was another leaky thing. I can't remember what it was offhand. I have a note of it, but uh, it's in this screen of notes. So I went around the business of um, dealing with all those leaks. So I just got out a spanner, went around the building and did all that. And I got a, a water bottle, plastic water bottle, filled it with water and put one in each system in the building. And it cost us nothing. And we took our water usage per annum down from two and a half million litres to 800, uh, to 800 tonnes of water a year. So 800,000 litres. So it was a 66% saving for no cost whatsoever. I will, except for the few bottles of water that I had to drink so that I could put them into the, uh, put waste water into the, um, into the bottles in the system. So that was the first step and that, and that really got us going. That was like, this is an amazing thing to do. So then we went about the business of changing all the domestic lights in the building. So everything was CFL, so it was relatively energy efficient. But what we realised was that every area was just way too bright. Now, each unit had two lamps in it. So we just simply took out every other lamp and that immediately halved our electricity bill in the lighting area uh, throughout the building. The next step a few years later was to change all of that to LED lighting. And that was simply because CFLs, while they're relatively efficient, they contain mercury, they're very difficult to recycle, um, they're, in, well, they're entirely cost ineffective to recycle. So generally, a lot of it ends up going into waste. There's ceramics, there's precious metals, and there's, there's uh, mercury and glass. So that does end up going into landfill or being poorly recycled. And so we were going through probably, uh, probably about 300 lamps a year uh, just in natural wastage with with units being on all day so when we changed to led um led panels for all of the domestic lighting in the building we now go through two a year so this again <clears throat> we had to do it on a budget but ultimately it cost around ten thousand euro and part of the uh, i'll get to the the final figure at the end but we we graphed all of this as well so that we had the spend out and the saving in. <clears throat> the next thing that we had to look at was our heating system and it was oil. So we investigated various different, uh, various different versions of heating and how we could improve the heating. So we were using around 30,000 litres of oil a year and through careful management, reducing temperatures in places, insulating doors and so on, <clears throat> and, um, and not doing things like having the heating all day and then opening the seam dock door for loading and all of that heat goes out. Uh, so all of that sort of sensible management, we managed to knock off 10,000 litres a year of oil. But then we had to look at ways of making this more efficient because there was still an issue where our, hot, our domestic water was being heated by the main boiler. So in the summer, if we needed domestic water, the boiler had to be on. Now it wasn't heating radiators or whatever, but it was an enormous lump of a boiler to be heating some, some water. So we had to split the hot water and the building heating. And after, after much soul searching and investigation, we ended up going with gas, which while it's far more efficient, it's still problematic because it's fossil. <clears throat> but in balance at the moment, the technology wasn't there. We kind of investigated heat pumps and so on, but the way that uh, theatre works, it doesn't really, and well, certainly with an old building, our building 
is uh, an 18th century prison. And so it comes with its problems. Um, <clears throat> but uh, doing the likes of a heat pump, it just doesn't work for that sort of a building because you've got the constant temperature balance, but you've got doors opening, doors closing and people moving between areas and, you know, the technology will probably become better and we'll revisit the whole gas situation then. But uh, in, the, in the interim, we, we changed over to gas. <clears throat> so that was a big investment. We got help from SEAI and we got help from the, the county council. But we ended up taking um, our, our energy, um, our heating down from an initial point in 2009 of uh, 320,000 kilowatt hours to um, 200,000 kilowatt hours today. So there's still a saving of 120,000 kilowatt hours. And going from our initial reduction, we're still looking at a 60,000 kilowatt hour a year saving. So the, it, tied in with that was also things like a better building management system so that we could control the, the zones and the areas a bit better. The building is, heat, uh, is heated through air handling, which has worked out wonderfully for the pandemic because it means that we have very positive uh, ventilation in the building. However, one of the knock-on effects of the pandemic is that you can't recirculate any air. So you're constantly heating cold air coming in. So it's fresh air in, fresh air out. So that will have a negative impact on our carbon footprint for, for the, certainly for the time of the pandemic. We may get to a point where we can do a certain amount of recirculation, but. So those were the sort of main points that we looked at. And then um, eventually I got around to theater lighting. Uh, it, it seemed like we would never get there and the technology seemed to be moving fast, um, but it wasn't really moving fast enough. But what we did do was uh, about four years ago, we tackled the artistic side, so to speak, and uh, um, went into the, the changeover from uh, <clears throat> tungsten, uh, tungsten, um, tungsten sources to LED sources. So we started off with the big burning units like the cyclorama and the park hands, and then slowly but surely, moved on and on. So we're at a position now where our core rig is LED. So all of our, all of our Fresnels over stage, our psych lights and our parkans, all of the saturated colors and front house washes. However, we have to do a balance between what you do with tungsten lanterns that were designed to last for 40, 50 years and are used for an actor standing up stage for 15 seconds, and then they're not used again for a fortnight, and then they're not used again for another month. So there was this whole sort of a debate going on as to whether, whether we just changed completely to LED or whether we ended up with a blend of LED and tungsten. So that's what we're kind of plumped for at the moment. As the technology moves forward and the pricing comes down of the LED units, um, we'll probably revisit it. But I think there is still room for a certain degree of tungsten lighting in, in theatre for the reason that being green isn't just all about energy in. A lot of it is about what you're getting rid of and getting rid of perfectly functional theatre lights that are used for a very small amount of time for a certain effect, to my mind, is a greener option than simply replacing everything with LED. Um, all, of the, all of the precious minerals and uh, um, all of the mining, and all, an awful lot of the LED units, their, their, their housings are, uh, are plastic or carbon plastic. And all of the manufacture of that kind of stuff, we need to kind of take in that cost as well, but the environmental cost to that and, and also the, uh, the environmental cost of the mining and where all of this, where all these precious metals in the circuit boards and in the LEDs, in the, in the, 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 the coatings of the LEDs come from. <clears throat> uh, these finite resources that we're ripping out of the earth. And if I throw away a strand cantata that has, uh, that has um, plastic and metal, it's about six kilos of metal, four and a half kilos of metal in that. You know, with the best will in the world, the way that recycling is going at the moment, it's not going to end up being recycled. It's going to be 
thrown on a ship to China and it's going to pollute someone else's backyard. And uh, yeah, so that balance is that balance is important. It's important to me. But the um, the net saving with all of this investment, the man hours investment and the actual cost investment <clears throat> between 2009 and uh, 2019, um, the net saving to the arts centre uh, in cash terms was 35,000, even although we've invested over 100,000 in greening the venue since then. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good news story, and it's e but so much of it is easily done. So much of it is, is just about uh, passion and thinking outside the box. And I can't, uh, I can't emphasize how much people like Phil Walker, he's, um, uh, he's uh, an energy consultant. Um, Phil costs 100 quid a year plus fat, and what he gives to the venue in terms of bright ideas as to how we can save energy and how we can recycle more and reuse things uh, is just is worth its weight in gold. And the next big project is to put solar PV on the roof. So uh, I have to get the leaks in the roof fixed first, but uh, one step at a time. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. It sounds like you've made some huge changes and an investment in the future that's just going to keep on giving. Um, and I, I like the idea of a, a green consultant that only costs 100 euro a year plus VAT. That's excellent. Great value for money. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Um, well, you certainly raised some really interesting points that we might come back and address uh, at the end. Um, we move on to you, Maeve, um, and uh, if you'd like to tell us about your views on the area. Sure, and thank you for having me as part of the panel this evening. It's great to hear about some of the work that's happening. Um, and something came to mind listening to Nick, um, if anybody's interested, the Energy Agency for Dublin Codema have a really great domestic energy toolkit, uh, both just practical um, tips for people in their homes, and they also have in a variety of libraries across the country, an energy monitor that you can pick up. It's a little suitcase and it will actually test where heat is being lost in your home and various different things, and it's very easy to use. Um, so yeah, just congratulations on uh, on such a, an amazing start with the Dunamay's kind of uh, retrofit and, and resilience building into the future. It sounds really fantastic. Um, the other sort of point, I suppose, from, from Mary's uh, work and, uh, and what you were saying about uh, human rights being central to all of this, I couldn't agree more. Um, and one of the things that feels really great uh, working and thinking about this um, knotty problem, as I like to call it, is how it intersects with various different forms of injustice, be that inequities between the gender or the, you know, the divide between the global north and the global south. I think there's no way of fixing the biggest problems that we're facing here without fixing quite a few other problems um, at the same time. So very inspiring and um, thank you. I suppose to give you a sense of who I am and why I'm here, uh, I'm an artist, I work in theatre and film um, and uh, I guess I hit a wall uh, probably about six or seven years ago thinking about what my work was actually um, uh, doing, you know, where it was, where it was landing, the impact it was having. And I think I was also grieving uh, because the climate crisis had hit me. It hit me like a wall. And uh, I kind of uh, struggled with why making art as a response to the enormity of the, the crisis that we're facing would be a relevant response. Like part of me was going, I need to retrain, I need to become an environmental scientist or you know, uh, some, somebody who can have a practical impact on this. And it was a really difficult time. It was a really confronting time to actually look at the thing that you've you know, developed your skills and the tools that you have and the thing that you love doing and wonder, is it worth anything in the context that we are in? And luckily, I kind of came through that dark period to realizing that uh, more and more 
the information that we have is not in debate. You know, 99.9% as of today uh, of all climate scientists agree that climate, uh, climate change and climate breakdown is created by humans. So the science isn't up for debate. That is fact. The thing that's happening, though, is that it's it's reaching a bottleneck where it's not actually landing with people. So regardless of how many times we say your house is on fire, nobody's getting out of the house and doing something about the fire. And I started to realize kind of what Mary was saying, how powerful and potent um, storytelling can be in translating abstract ideas in the lived experience for people into something that connects emotionally with them. And that brings, I think some of the un, unfathomable or overwhelming aspects of the climate crisis uh, are too big to look at. And I think in theatre, one of the things that we're really good at is taking ideas and experiences that are overwhelming and really, really difficult and looking at them in a slightly different way, just shifting the lens slightly to the left to make it possible for people to experience that feeling without also feeling in danger. So it's quite cathartic in that way. And I guess over time, I've started to really appreciate the value of storytelling in this particular context. And so I've been trying to learn how to use the tools and skills that I have as a storyteller in a practical way. And uh, that's taken me on some odd journeys so far. Um, I was involved in a project called Cultural Adaptations, um, which was a European research project that happened in five different cities across Europe. So it was uh, Dublin, Glasgow, Gothenburg, and Ghent, sorry, four, four cities. And each city had an artist, an embedded artist, and uh, adaptation partner and a cultural partner. And the idea was to look at the role of the artist in climate adaptation. So that was an incredible experience because not only did it um, introduce me to work and thinking that's been happening in various different contexts across Europe, uh, it threw me in the deep end existentially thinking about, okay, so what, what you know, it was exactly what I needed at that time. What is my role here? Um, and the, the, I guess the offer on the table of, thinking of artists not only as people who make art to be enjoyed and entertainment or you know challenging political art to to sort of meet an audience but that artists are also creative thinkers who in this particular moment that we're facing into where every human system that we have created will no longer be fit for purpose in 10 or 15 years all of those systems need to be redesigned and it's a fool's game to try and redesign them using all of the same elements and expect to get to a different outcome. So I got quite excited actually being a part of that project and realizing that if you've got a peppering of rogue thinkers um, or odd artists that you can embed into systems that are in that process of redesign, you will get to a different outcome. And you know, it might not, it might not get you to all of your solutions, but it will bring you somewhere new. Um, and that was really encouraging and inspiring to me because I think like, it's funny, I think it was the perfect uh, steps along the way of having Mary with the, you know, the really high conceptual ideas of, of, you know, where we are and what climate change and climate breakdown means for people. And then Nick laying out a really functional, practical map, essentially. Um, and I think that's the trajectory that we need, you know, we need to confront the the big scary thing and, and become used to having it there because it is there, whether we're looking at it or not, dealing with the emotions inside of that and then start to look for the map, you know, the, the road through it. So I guess out of the back of um, cultural adaptations finished in March of this year and uh, yeah, really grateful to have been part of that project. Um, and especially because it is, uh, it embedded me with access in Ballymun and that's a relationship that has continued and been really central for the work that I've been doing since. Um, we began a green arts department for the building and I am the lead artist involved in projects running through that org organization now. So yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic as a way of beginning networks, I suppose. And that's one of the things that I've seen 
my role being useful, I suppose, in this moment, I can see myself being useful in beginning networks. So um, reaching out to other artists and starting conversations. And um, yeah, I think, I think just asking that question of how do we start? Because we're quite far behind, I think, um, at a European level. Uh, uh, so it sounds like the guys in Dunamaze are <laughs> streaking ahead. So maybe, I mean, I would say, I think in Ireland, we, uh, I'm just gonna make one of those really annoying generalizations now, but I think we are good at ignoring, ignoring a problem until we stop ignoring it. And then we're very good at changing. And that would be one of the things that I, I get hope, hope from as well is, you know, if we look back at the last 10 years in terms of cultural and ideological change, this country has been through really transformative processes. And I think that's what we need now. We need, we need everybody to show up. And I would say if you are interested in showing up and beginning the journey and starting to walk, there's a march uh, on the 6th of November, um, which falls in the middle of the COP26, which is the Conference of the Parties happening in Glasgow this year, which will be the moment where international governments review and hopefully uh, become more ambitious with our climate targets and so there'll be a climate march uh, in Dublin at noon gathering at the Garden of Remembrance and um, which is being organized by COP26 Coalition Ireland. We're going to have a creative block <laughs> for artists and anybody working in the arts so you can come find us we'll have a big banner that says artists united behind the signs uh, and then equally, there are marches happening in different cities um, across the country. So if you look for uh, COP26 Coalition Ireland, you'll find the one nearest to you. And I would encourage you to travel as little as possible, obviously. <laughs> um, but yes, I think I think for anybody who's looking for, you know, the invitation, this is the invitation. And all you need to do is show up and take a few steps in the right direction. Thanks very much, Maeve. That's that's really inspiring. Um, well, uh, just to pick up on on your points and Mary's point about, you know, how do you inspire people to shift that lens to, to move? Um, I can't help but draw the analogy to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, back in 1948 when the world came together and said World War Two can never happen again. Um, you know, those atrocities can never happen again. I think that the, the more, the, I mean, the, the work even that Greta has done single handedly as a as, as a young, young woman um, to, to raise awareness. Um, and there is only so, so long people can keep their heads in the sand. I, I, I do think that the um, the say one of the few positives of the pandemic is the um, awareness and appreciation for nature. Uh, that people have had on an individual, uh, had had the opportunity to enjoy and and help them keep seeing uh, in an individual basis. Uh, and here's hoping that um, I suppose the arts. What what can we do? I'm going to throw out some questions. What can we do to um, to impact change rather than just raise awareness? I mean, raising awareness is is crucial, but how do we impact change? I'll throw that question out to all of you. I will. I will. Uh, just while you're while you're um, oh. mulling it over, uh, I will say that certainly um, our approach to the human rights uh, to the festival, the rights on the rooftop, was very much. And um, when we're talking about human rights, we wanted to concentrate on celebrating them and empowering people. Mm. And I think that. Um, the idea of empowering people about their own patch of garden. I know it's very easy to look at, at the, the state of the climate and throw your hands up in, in absolute despair. Um, but what if, if we use our imaginations, what if we all take our own little piece and we, we do what we can right down from recycling? Certainly I know uh, my recycling habits over the last two years because I've had the time to think about it as well. You know, that I, I've, I've, like to think I've um, uh, increased my my efforts at recycling by about a thousand percent just because it's you know all of a sudden nature and and uh, you have more time on your hands to think. But um, 
get, do any of you have any views on how we can we can impact change? I think well, we've. I, got- I, yeah, I'll say a few words on that now, and it's not necessarily that I have the answer to that, because I've always taught or felt that the arts themselves, in terms of using the arts for human rights, they really are about telling alternative narratives or enabling alternative narratives or alternative stories to be told because I think storytelling is a big part of the arts in relation to human rights and for me the arts are always about and in my experience if you go in to a community or a school using the arts for a human rights issue or any issue um, the more you're using your art to raise questions and to raise discussion and debate as opposed to telling people what the answers or solutions and the more the art, the more successful is the art form in raising awareness. Um, and that sounds like a, a paradox or contradiction, but the arts are full of paradoxes. So if you go in raising questions and opening up issues for debate, and you're bringing that to the people you're working with, and they're a key part of that, very often that's where change can come from. It's about bringing people together. So it might necessarily mean that the arts will make the change happen. The arts can be like the ripple in the water or the stimulus. And for me, the arts are as well about, we can create new visions to the arts. So we, the arts can be transforming in that sense. What is the vision we want for the world? And can we show new visions through the artworks we're making? Um, so I like the idea of the arts being about generating dialogue and discussion and debate, and then putting that out there and see what change comes out of that. And yes, it can raise awareness and facts and figures and all of that. But really, you are, I suppose, trying to create conversations, creative conversations, and get people talking about what's important. And, and I, one other thing I would say, too, is one thing I felt about the pandemic, which, which really brought home to me, just as an individual, was how our cities and our planning and all of that, because sometimes we don't think about who plans the city and how are our cities created and our public spaces. Our public spaces are all about cars and business. They're not about people. Our public spaces aren't created for people or people aren't put first. And even the fact you've seen local communities try to create these spaces of, you know, how to get people back out into public spaces and not have machinery or cars present. You know, even doing our play, Geraldine, right on the rooftop, constant noise of construction around us while yeah. we're working in a natural environment. Now you need, you know, we need construction, but people are what counts. So how do we get people involved and not local communities. So I'd love to see, I'd love to see more wildfire meadows. Everyone's talking about that, but not, not, not local authorities telling us what to do. Schools, communities, everybody getting together and saying, we want to create the environment we want to see. And what is that vision? And how can we do that together? So how can people have the power? They're the type of conversations that maybe art can get us talking about. And that I'm might really- really change. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree that as a conversation catalyst, uh, when you empower people to take ownership, uh, then you get so many more potential solutions and so many more creative ideas. Uh, so outlier ideas, um, as, as may have mentioned, you know, you could have 10 different ideas to solve one problem and they'll all work in a different way. Uh, but I do agree, Mary, it, it, it does come down to, I think it's, it's, it's the power of people voting with their feet as well. It's looking around and, and um, saying, well, what are the issues that are important to us and, and bringing pressure to bear them through. I mean, we've seen again, just again through the pandemic in particular, marches, Black Lives Matter issues that when people uh, drove together in peaceful protest, they can't be ignored. Mm. You know, there's the, the, the power of people coming together to, to, to demand change of their governments. Um, because governments are up for re-election and, you know, the, 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 uh, the, we all have the right to, to, to vote and to, um, to actually form a, an influence uh, how, governments, how governments behave, um, albeit it might be every four years, but, but still, it's, um, it, the power is there. Um, it's the small single actions as well, though, and I think that's what people tend to... You know, people, you, you do you do something and you think I, I'm on my own doing this, but uh, it's once you start to realise that everybody's on their own doing it. So it's you know it's it's the same as going in to vote. You go in and you do it on your own, but if we all do whatever we can or whatever small thing it is, 
it does all help and it does seem that you're 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 battling against the man and you're battling against the um the the vast consumer society that is just all about new 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 you know it's i mean i'm, I'm currently using i'm talking to you from a mac that has been rebuilt about four times and uh was bought in 2011 and it still does everything i need to do at work and all of all of the computers that we use on the technical side and the artistic side at work are all rebuilds two of them actually came out of skips and were just rebuilt but you know it's all of that sort of stuff we don't need an iphone 23 we've got an iphone 5 it's you know but all of those little bits and pieces like i i i've People will always say to you, oh, it's a waste of time. You, you know, what, what can my little thing do? I've been, I've been a vegan for 36 years. And I don't go around trumping, oh, I'm a vegan. Don't be doing that. Never tell anyone else what to eat. Um, although sometimes the family might argue uh, that I do tell people what to eat. <laughs> but, um, you know, that sort of thing. I, I never expected to change the world. But I did expect to make a little impact on it and if everybody that feels that way makes that little impact and we vote and we vote with our feet and we do all of these small personal actions there are an awful lot of us there are far more of us than there are corporate ceos and we have a lot more power in our in our small voices because there are billions of them than the corporate CEOs have in their big shouty four-wheel drive Jaguar type things. So they, you know, they are they are the ones that are the problem, but we are the ones that are the solution to this. Because we can tell them by not giving them our Euros and by not allowing them to to determine that we have to buy this t-shirt this week and another one next week and another one the week after that it's perfectly good to um I have a tour t-shirt from 1981 was this was this what I was wearing yesterday and you say yeah it was actually so um, <laughs> no it's that sort of uh, you know I, actually Angelina Jolie the, uh, the other day her daughter was uh, out at some red carpet um uh, event in a dress that she had uh, that she had worn at a red carpet event years ago and little things like that because I mean that would have just been so easy for her to go and just say to some designer give me another dress for the daughter would you and that would all be done but no reduce reuse and recycle every little bit every little bit helps. I heard a, a variation of that a few years ago that I've, I've been trying to replace it with which is refuse reduce reuse recycle That's, yeah yeah uh, which I think is is definitely the motto that you live by already. Um, it's interesting. Like I think when I when I think about you know coming back together and people have missed art and missed theatre, missed film so much over the last year and a half, and just being in spaces together, experiencing things. I think it's made me realise that empathy and imagination have the same heart. They have the ability to imagine things that make us all a bit more connected to one another. And that's an incredible power. Um, and it's something that I get a lot of strength from. And on a bad day, I guess I am worried that we're waiting until the waters around our waist to start swimming. Um, that's something that's a bit scary. And it's also completely understandable because like you guys are describing, we live in a, a capitalist monster that has been designed and refined to distract us. We live in a very distracted reality. And I guess uh, one of the things that I've been working on recently is um, research for a feature film, which is dealing with some of these topics. And the tagline that we came up with was, when capitalism and environmentalism meet, you get dark comedy. And that is true. <laughs> like they can't coexist comfortably. Like there's a deep irony in, in everything that we do in a Western context. And I think there's a huge amount of personal guilt that's generated because of that, because, you know, 
we have to shop in supermarkets if we live in certain places. We have to drive if we live in certain places. And the mechanisms that surround us don't support uh, an ideal life, you know? We haven't got there yet. But I think that there's, um, there's a real power, as Nick says, in the collective voice. So one of the things that I, I always hope to sort of spark in people is it just forgive yourself. Whatever you're doing that isn't perfect, forgive yourself. Whatever you, you know, maybe you eat meat, maybe you fly, maybe you um, do X, Y, or Z, maybe you don't even recycle. Like make a contract with yourself that allows you to get past feeling guilty and get to the starting line of doing something. Because I think um, that's one of the biggest levers actually for me at a personal level. And then the other thing I think with art um, having an impact and a direct impact for me, the biggest lever in that has been nature and turning to nature as a subject, as a space, as a theme, as an idea. Um, because I guess one of the, <laughs> there's an amazing academic called Sinead Mercier and she had a book out last year called The Men Who Eat Ring Forts. And one of the things that she talks about in that book is the idea of the moment in human history, uh, the Enlightenment. And that was the moment where we decided that as a species, we are not of nature. We are outside of nature and we are masters of nature. And it's something that's kind of embedded into an awful lot of the societal and cultural structures that we've inherited over time, be that religion or art, um, you know, is the idea that man is mighty and man sits above nature and controls the chaos that we see in nature and I think that's the thing that went wrong at a big big level because once we stepped in our own minds because in reality of course we are nature and so this idea of protecting nature has to start with yourself you know it's recognizing that you in 20 30 years time most likely will still be alive will be on this planet and will be dealing with the consequences of uh, climate breakdown so you are nature along with everything else and once you pull that lever of reconnecting people and it's like what you were describing um earlier Ger geraldine of like people re reconnecting with their local green spaces because it's the core comfort when things aren't right the core comfort is the mother and the mother is earth. And it's recognizing that we are completely embedded in these systems, whether we like it or not, and denying it has led to all of this trouble. So that's my little monologue about nature. <laughs> well, and just to chip in with you on that, I, what I will say, and to draw in on what Mary was saying earlier, I, you know, one of the main themes in the, in the festival, when we are reiterating, um, you know, the importance of human rights and dignity for all, uh, and equality uh, is, uh, as you say, may have start with yourself, you know, recognize that dignity in yourself, that ability to, to have rights, to have freedoms, and then to lift the mirror, turn the mirror on your loved ones and your family. And I think despite all of the Amazon buying online during the pandemic, to me, and I think to a lot of people, the, the most precious thing, the most valuable thing in the world became a hug because you couldn't hug those close to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to think that uh, I'm an optimist when it comes to to people, you know, being able to shift that lens to to, you know, when they look around and say, even if they're talking about themselves and their families, their children, their grandchildren, their nieces, their nephews, you know, and thinking, what do they deserve? As you say, in 10, 15, 20, 30 years time, are you going to be the, the master of your demise? Are you going to be the masters of um, working with nature, giving nature the chance to flourish? And um, because when you even look, when you remember back to the photos of Tokyo and New York, you know, when, when uh, right at the beginning of the lockdown, when the smog was lifting, when the actual country, and to, to, to quote a line from, from one of your pieces of poetry, Mary, uh, from rights in the rooftop, the world is breathing again. You know, it just, uh, I think it's only when you, when you see that kind of stark reality of a landmark city that you, you're used to seeing the smog and that smog lifts, you know, you don't want to go back. It's like it's like blended working all of a sudden people who are going mad working at home, you know, like the idea of blended working because you can have hopefully the best of both worlds that, you you know, you can sit out in your garden if you're lucky enough to have one or sit beside your plants <laughs> and breathe in a bit of nature. Um, but I, I, 
could I come in there actually yeah. because you you've stoked a memory for me and um uh, and Mary had mentioned the incredible movement in uh, the global youth strike there's uh, another march tomorrow there's a global climate strike tomorrow at 1 p.m meeting or no on, on Friday sorry it's always on Friday so uh, at 1 p.m Marion Square and uh, the thing that it reminded me of is actually at the last global climate strike in 2019 one of the things that struck me was how intergenerational it actually was. And I think one of the things that's happening is yes, we have this huge um, surge of energy from the youth strikers because they are looking at their future and they are seeing a crap deal coming down the line for them and crap is so understated. <laughs> um, but there's also this idea of generativity, which happens in the old elder generations, you know, where the elders in the community want to leave the environment better for the generations to come. And it's it's really inspiring to see it in an awful lot of the um, environmental agencies that a volunteer run are run by people in retirement. Um, there is a, a real catalyst, I think, if we link the generations together, because I think if we stay in our isolation and if we sort of pigeonhole things and if we allow it to lay on the shoulders of young people and don't assume that it should be an intergenerational you know, fight, then we miss a trick because there's a knowledge that can be shared. And people over 65 are the most reliable voters of all. They have an awful lot of free time and currently are probably the wealthiest generation <laughs> in our country. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, touch on that idea of the invitation is not just to young people, it's to everybody. And, and I think the more connected the generations are in tackling these problems, the better we'll be. And it really taps into uh, an idea that comes up within indigenous cultures again and again, and it's leaving enough for the seventh generation. So the idea is that you never use so much that there won't be some left over for the seventh generation to come. Um, and I love that. To go on from what you said as well, made the, the the one step, and I think I think if everybody makes that step, but I think for me, um, it, the you have to be optimistic. You know, it's 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 um, it's such a song destroying topic mm. that it's very easy just to just be pessimistic about it and just say, do you know what? Poof, it's just too big, and and making that first step and and seeing a result, and even if it's only a small result, like we dug a pond in the garden during the lockdown and we've got uh, all manner of creepy things uh, crawling around and swimming around in the pond. And it's just wonderful, you just wander out and those those sort of, you know, the, any little step, if you if you take it with an optimistic pinch of salt, uh, the, uh, uh, the wide-eyed optimism of Charlie Brown, uh, or uh, Linus rather, um, as opposed to Charlie Brown's sort of, oh, here we go again. That, um, you know, that I think it just all helps, you know, and and it help, I think it helps too to show the young people that we can be optimistic about it, then that, that, that we can find solutions to it mm. and we can work towards a solution because it's it, pessimism is, uh, is, uh, um, an epidemic as well. It's a, I can't think of the word for it. It, it spreads. It's like yawns. Because, because we are empathetic beings. Yeah. Um, if one person yawns, the rest of us yawn. And it's the same as if one, one of us is pessimistic. We all start to feel down. But if we can step lightly and step forward with an open heart towards this, I think we can make a change. We really can make a change yeah. uh, in, in our small ways and hopefully in big ways. But, um, Can I offer as well as that, because it's such a beautiful point to make. Um, I've just finished a postgrad in climate entrepreneurship. Weird, but I did it. Uh, and the thing that really struck me was the more you talk to people working in this area, the more optimistic you get. So I think that there is a there's a there's a dark holding place before you sort of face up to things and start moving forward where everything feels huge and undoable but actually the people that are working day to day on this as a, as a, a topic are incredibly optimistic and that's given me a huge amount of, of hope <laughs> uh, and it's also made it easier to just keep keep moving forward like Nick's saying just keep moving forward and taking steps and making changes. And I think Nick's example your example Nick of just how much water when you went around the building how much how much leaks 
just with a manual, you know, with your screwdriver or whatever, whatever piece of equipment you had to to fix the leaks. It's huge. 66% less water leaking out of the building. Yeah, um, I still could never get over how much water we were using. Mm, yeah. away. Every time I look at the figures, I just go, how? How was that? How did we let that happen? Yeah. And how much of it was drinkable versus using rainwater? Oh. In Ireland, we don't use water at all. All of it was drinkable. All of it was potable water. That yeah. was good water just yeah. being totally wasted but if you think that was that was in one small art center in a small town in the midlands mm. you know it, we, we don't even have that many loos in the building you know um so it's uh if every if everybody in every venue just just did a leak test uh, every few months it would make a huge difference mm. Mm. Well, you've certainly shown us how one way of, of how the arts uh, can be more sustainable in itself. And um, another issue that sort of came to mind in relation to the, the event was um, I'm interested to see or hear your views on given the increase of online events and the awareness around carbon footprints. Do you think that um, this will have a long term impact on the arts going forward um, and tours, for example, or or do you think it has this been a a way to um, discover how to do things better, or do we still want to sit in the darkness of a theatre and feel that feel that invisible connection? <laughs> I think uh, I think with today's announcement that uh, we're going to go back to a hundred percent capacity, albeit with um, vaccine certificates and uh, and masks when you're moving around, I think there's an awful lot of people very happy about getting to sit in the dark beside someone again for uh, for a bit of art um there will oddly enough i was talking to a chap who specializes in um in streaming events um uh, conference services and john was saying yesterday about uh <clears throat> they had to completely change their business model for the pandemic and they um they would have done a lot of corporate gigs uh, you know projections on the side of buildings all of this sort of stuff so while the projections on the side of buildings sort of end things was all going was still going going on because you know people were wanting positive messages to be to be beamed around and that was great but um all of the conference stuff just completely dried up and they built a couple of they converted their their warehouse into studios and uh and did blended um oh, for everyone for the islamic society in the uk and for the jewish society in the uk and for the london irish um so there was a uh, their business changed fundamentally but what John was saying yesterday was he can already see that uh, there's a, there's an urge a hankering to get back in the room with people and the way it looks like it's going to be for them is a blended very much a blended sort of a thing so while you mightn't have the people traveling from Japan and Hong Kong and wherever else uh, you will have the the local the the, the local cohort in a hotel talking out to the, the people in the wider world. And I think in a lot of instances, um, theatre venues and theatre companies will tap into it to an extent just to expand the audience, very much like we see with National Theatre Live. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to be able to see National Theatre Productions or the Metropolitan Opera sitting in, in, uh, in the Dunamis Arts Centre or in the Solstice in Navin, you know, or, it's an amazing thing to be able to to share in those artistic events and it'll give all of the Irish production companies the likes of Rough Magic and um, and all of the others the opportunity I know Rough Magic have actually done it before but it'll give them a, an easier opportunity to do this um, an awful lot of the venues did invest in putting in streaming systems so uh, yeah I'd be I'd be uh, I'd be hopeful that it will end up being a blended thing and it'll help as well because there will be people who won't need to travel. They'll be able to see their, their, their productions, but it will still be a benefit to the artists because there'll still be revenue and more will be produced and life will continue somehow uh, in, in, a, in a form similar, but uh, possibly slightly better than we had before. But uh, yeah like sitting in the dark watching a play. 
<laughs> there's a something I, I think the touring question is the burning issue in theater and music you know because it's the only way to make an income really as an artist working in either form and um, I worked for years with Pan Pan as an associate artist and uh, one of the things that Gavin Quinn was good for doing was to uh, translate productions locally so he would go to China and none of the actors would come and he would work with a local cast and it, you know whatever set would be sourced locally so there's something about thinking thinking differently about what the local versus global structure for touring might look like maybe there's something about selling the IP for a production particularly original pieces to different theatre companies so we could buy in the intellectual property for somebody's show that was on in Belgium and have Broken Talkers you know present it in Dublin you know whatever whatever it ends up being I think that there's an awful lot of very smart people thinking about it at the moment and looking for solutions but I think touring won't be the same. That's a lovely idea though as well that's a, that's you know I mean because the, the technological the te technological answer is uh, is one thing but uh, like a proper artistic answer to it like that where where you've got a, um, a local company producing a, a piece that's been produced in another country is is uh, I mean, obviously, it's it's what we all do, but it's to have that immediacy. Uh, yeah. The piece has just been in Dublin, and now it's just in Hong Kong as a tour, but entirely different, but entirely the same, but local. So uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. really yeah, it's really good. It brings it back to the universality of of storytelling. It really does, yeah, exactly. To, to the, sort of the key of what we what we we hope to do, you know, to spread our stories and tell our tales to as many people as possible. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's, there's Georgian, you know, the, the poem that I wrote in Time, which was about, I suppose, a vision for the future, but I do have a line in it that says, we will meet each other in the darkness of a theater space and know again the magic of a connection that is invisible, yet truly felt. And I think that invisible connection you know the work we've been doing lately and I, a lot of companies are doing the fact we're back out meeting whether it's indoors or outdoors you can feel that magic there's a palpable air of joy when we're in performances at the moment and that's where we get our hope from and this idea of being positive the fact that people are coming back together and this connection of community you'll feel it in a theatre you'll feel it in a uh, you know any kind of arts gathering where people come together so I think the hybrid form is going to be kept for a while and it has certain benefits but the idea of that connection of people coming together you know even this morning our first show went up this morning and it was raining you know that heavy rain we had this morning and we were going to say we leave it to the school to decide and the school said no we're coming rain or not and there was just that yeah. that desire Hunger. to get out yeah. and be together and be connected and it's you know that is magic and we, we need that um, yeah. and does that Judas, line, that line yeah, but just yeah. to say that line of, of your poem has resonated with audiences in the show, the rights of the roof on the rooftop. You, you can almost see it sort of a smile spread like a Mexican wave in response yeah. to that line of your poem, Mary. It's yeah. beautiful. Um, and, and because the conversation um, that Nick and Maeve were bringing up, there's two things that struck me. One is this idea of visibility and invisibility, that in a way, a lot of the time the arts are often invisible or arts that are not necessarily mainstream are invisible. And it's the same with human rights. Frontline defenders who are partner in the festival would often say what they want to do is bring more visibility to the stories of human rights defenders and what's happening around human rights. Um, and, you know, even, for example, when it comes to the environment, a huge percentage of human rights activists, it's about indigenous communities and they're under attack for standing up for the rights of um, you know, their own communities in, in, in relation to the environment. But I think we really need to look at what we want to make visible and what is important. And the arts can play a big role in that. And I also think too, we want to make things invisible, but, and this is nothing new, we want to keep things small. And that's something that struck me, you know, the power of small companies, everything has gone so big and so global. We really need to protect small arts companies because they are under threat, I feel. Um, for the bigger arts type organizations. And again, there can be all kinds, but we really need to look after the small artists, the small arts organizations, the independent groups that are out there working. And, and it's the same with the environment, looking after 
you know, I don't like telling people what to do, but don't go buying on Amazon, go out and find the local independent producer and support them. Um, and that's the idea you're saying about having the local artists and the local communities. We need much more of that in our world. Absolutely. And I think that, that just to round, round off, that's a great point to round off on, Mary, that in times where we've become... Uh, we've 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 accepted like the world accepted you cannot go beyond two kilometers for your food or for a walk or for exercise you know um and learned the the value of a of a small carbon footstep um that we can have small artistic carbon footsteps as well that we can have local local grown um artists and and um and companies that will uh share it share shared with our local communities as well um we are i'm conscious we've gone way over time i want to thank everybody and um, thank you mary thank you nick thank you Maeve, uh, for your thought-provoking presentations this evening um i'll just take this last opportunity to remind people there are lots of really fun events and thought-provoking events that are still to come on the dublin arts and human rights festival from smashing times and lots of other um um, lots of other contributors and supporters, all of whom I can't remember, but you will see on Smashing Times website. Uh, and as well as this, this is one of a few podcasts, or I think it's the eighth one that will be available. It's been recorded and uh, there are some others up online as well. So they may not be going up immediately, but um, over the next week or two, you'll see some really uh, inspiring um uh, web web webinars and, and podcasts as well so all that remains for me is to say thank you very much uh, Nick, Maeve and Mary for joining us and thank you very much to our audience out there for um, for taking the time to um, to sit with us and think about arts, climate change and sustainability tonight stay Thanks, well Lily. thank you thank you